medical doctor and board certified nephrologist treating and caring for patients with kidney diseases. During the H1N1 flu outbreak, a series of events led Dr. Humphreys to question her hospital's vaccine protocol. The desire to properly treat her patients sparked an unquenchable search for answers. In the film, Bot, and her book, Dissolving Illusions, Dr. Humphreys dispels the myths surrounding disease and the pathology of vaccines. Please welcome Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. Dr. Humphreys, welcome. It's Hi, great to have you here. Thank you. I have, believe it or not, read through this book called Dissolving Illusions. It is a fascinating read. Thank you. And uh, I want to kind of just dive in. But before I do, because we're going to talk about vaccines, which is a really hot topic right now, as you know, but everyone's got an opinion. But to me, it's important that if someone has an opinion, what gives you the right to be that opinionated? Talk to me about your training. You are a doctor of what and all of the, uh, the training that you've gotten on this area. Okay. I am a conventionally educated medical doctor. Okay. I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania after receiving my bachelor's degree in physics. And then I went on to medical school and then I did a residency in internal medicine in New York City. And then I decided to specialize farther in nephrology, which is the study of kidneys. So I treated people for some endocrine diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, kidney failure. I had people on dialysis, lots of metabolic diseases, toxicities. And I taught medical residents, I taught students, and I taught fellow physicians in the field of nephrology and kidneys. Wow. Okay. So you're qualified. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned in one of the <clears throat> articles that it began to bother you with your patients that they were getting vaccinated as soon as they came into the hospital with kidney problems. Tell me a little bit about that. Is that when you first begin to kind of get a heads up and yes. a concern about vaccinations? Yes. And one of your first questions was, what, did I, what did, were we taught about vaccines yeah. in medical school? And the answer to that is precious little. What we're taught in medical school is the sheet of paper of the list of vaccines that are due to the childhood population and when to give them. And we're taught that they're safe and they're effective. We're taught that vaccines eradicated polio and smallpox and that they are the greatest medical invention ever. And there was never any question about vaccines for me. So I took vaccines before medical school and I gave my patients vaccines as a matter of going on dialysis. Everybody had to have hepatitis B vaccines, sometimes several series of vaccines because they didn't take. So it wasn't until I started to see people come into the hospital and they said to me, I was fine until I had that vaccine. Wow. And I said, what do you mean you were fine? They said, I was perfectly fine. I was healthy. I went to the doctor and I got my flu shot. And this was in 2009 when there was the swine flu shot that was separate from the regular flu shot. So people were often getting two shots that year, which I think may be why I saw more of it that year. Okay. So once those first few patients rolled in on dialysis saying that I was fine before that, I thought, well, how can that be? And so I looked into, because I never knew what was in a vaccine. Are you telling me that all of us think that every doctor we talk to is completely trained and an expert in vaccines, and you're telling me you never got trained in vaccines as a doctor? I'm telling you that's absolutely the truth, and that if you were to try to have a conversation with your doctor about the ingredients of vaccines, about the aluminum that's in vaccines, that what will happen is you'll, they'll start to get very defensive and stiff and tell you that they're not accepting non-vaccinating patients because they can't stand up to the scrutiny. They don't have the time. It's not that they're bad people. No. It's that they don't have the time and they haven't been educated and they're put in this position. Doctors are now put in this position where they're told from on high that vaccines are safe and effective and their non-vaccinating patients are a danger to society. And so they believe that. They believe that their non-vaccinating patients are a danger to other patients in the office. And so as a doctor, I always believed what was told to me from on high. And it wasn't until something didn't make sense to me that sent me to the books when people around me were saying, what you're seeing can't be possible. And I said, how can that be? Let me go research what's in vaccines. Let me research the safety of giving people that already have chronic diseases and kidney diseases vaccines. Let me go see what research is there. Let me see what happened with polio. 
let me see what really happened with smallpox. And let me tell you, it was a dark night for me when I started to really see what happened with those so diseases. So you can access all that data. It's there to look at. Absolutely. It's all in our medical literature. It's all in the history books. Everything that's in that book is referenced. There are over 800 references in that book. I know that as somebody who's critical of vaccination, I can't just give my opinion. I have to give fact that's backed by history, that's backed by documentation. That's not true of people who are supportive of vaccines. People who are supportive of vaccines can say things like, a baby can tolerate 10,000 vaccines all at once. One of the big figureheads, pro-vaccine doctors, Paul Offit, says this and stands by it, that a baby can tolerate 10,000 vaccines at once. Then he said, actually, it's 100,000 vaccines at once. But he doesn't have anything to back that up except a theory. Right. Okay? So I can't do that. I have to go into the medical literature and pull Very out good. the actual facts, what happened, what the congressional hearings said back in the 1950s about polio, what other doctors were saying about polio, what the statistics showed about polio. And I was thrown back on my heels when I saw what really happened. Yeah, I've, I've been under the assumption that we've got a healthy planet because vaccines are here and they have wiped out and then there's the list they've wiped out smallpox they've wiped out polio they've wiped out measles and so vaccines are really good now when you begin to research vaccines in the hospital because of the patients they're having adverse reactions to the vaccines yes well let me just step back a few steps because what happened at first were people who were healthy came in with kidney failure and right. and i believe it was caused by the vaccines the the ch medical charts and all the other specialists came by and said, etiology unclear, we don't know what happened here. And I said, but we have a clue. This person was given a vaccine, became immediately violently ill, and then be became dialysis dependent, at least temporarily, in some cases permanently. So why don't we look and see what happened with this vaccine? They vaccine didn't have kidney problems before no. they came. No. Oh, I no. thought it was... Okay. A very small segment of the population, it's very well documented again in medical literature through lots of case reports that people who are seemingly healthy get a vaccine and can have different forms of kidney dysfunction or failure. So that was my first clue. Wow. And, then I, and then I was met with so much resistance. See, ironically, if my administration in the hospital had said, oh yes, Dr. Humphreys, like any other drug, a vaccine is a drug and can cause side effects we're going to, you know, tell this person to avoid vaccines in the future. But instead they said, this isn't true, vaccines are safe and effective and we don't know what happened. And so that sent me researching. And also sent me, when I was consulted on a person in the hospital, I would go back and look at their medication history because as a nephrologist, about 80% of the time when someone has kidney failure, it's caused by a, an appropriately prescribed drug appropriately prescribed drug okay <laughs> so I would go and look at what the vaccination history was and sometimes I would see that within 24 hours of getting a vaccine in the hospital people would develop kidney failure within I was 24 hours. within 24 hours and I have it it's it's on my video honesty versus policy I show you the graphs of the patient charts of how this happens now is it common no it's not common but does it happen yes it happens and we need to be aware of that so if somebody has a susceptibility if they already have an inflammatory disease does it make sense to give them more inflammation through a vaccination my opinion was no let's not give them more inflammation let's wait until they're discharged from the hospital to give right. them a vaccine that makes sense. but i was met with even more resistance from the hospital administration because i was disrupting policy and to me that's when the bells started to go off because policy was more important than the health of my patients that i was put in charge of so i would admit somebody to get a kidney biopsy. This was an example. And I go up to the floor to see my, my patient, who's a 70-year-old woman who has mild kidney failure, a severe inflammatory kidney disease, and she's already been given a flu shot with my name on the order, but I didn't order it. So because the hospital the, just did it? Hospital policy was to vaccinate everybody who consented to vaccination on the day of admission within 24 hours because guess why if they didn't i found this out a couple years later that in many cases they wouldn't be reimbursed for the entire hospitalization because it was policy to get as many vaccines into people within that first 24-hour period for adults it was pneumonia vaccines and flu vaccines okay correct me if i'm wrong you just said that the hospital financially was better off the more vaccines they could get into a patient's and that's what you're that's what you noticed. 
Yes. Okay, we're going to take a break, and when we come right back, I want to pick up right here. And it's, So you're a doctor, you're looking after a patient, they're coming into the hospital, you're trained, you've got a brilliant mind, you're looking at how's the best way to look after them, and administration is just overriding you, not really looking at the patient, just this is the policy, this is the policy, this is the policy. Absolutely. So you begin to stand up to that. Where'd that get you? Well, there were meetings to discuss the problem of Dr. Suzanne Humphreys in the administration. <laughs> and I wasn't invited to these meetings, but the outcome of the meetings was that the policy will stay as it is and that I was confusing the nursing staff by canceling vaccination orders on people that I was consulted on and that I should stop doing it. And they recommended that I do a study as, with as many people as I could to look at if there was any um, kidney failure happening with the vaccines that were given in the hospital. And I thought to myself, why should a clinician be in charge of conducting a safety study on vaccines? Shouldn't that already be done? And if, with any other drug, if a clinician, a nephrologist comes along and says, this isn't safe, the drug isn't given, why are vaccines so protected? Why are they so special? And so they hired a consultant from outside uh, because they couldn't answer my, I, I, I wrote up a 12 page paper that's available on the internet and I submitted that with all the medical references and they couldn't meet my uh, arguments and so they hired a consultant from the outside and he basically gave me a list of studies showing that it was safe to give vaccines to people with HIV and so therefore it was safe to give vaccines to my patients with chronic kidney disease and so I thought Hmm. this is the expert and this is what he's saying and he said and this will become policy starting 2010 and there's nothing you can do about it and again this is all in my video documented called honesty versus policy or wow. I, I, I talk about this in great detail and so at that point I decided that I could spend the rest of my life battling with the hospital administration and um, creating a lot of negativity or I could peacefully leave my job which is what I ended up doing I was not fired I left in, in very good stand with the hospital, and um, I decided to educate parents, to educate myself farther, to educate any doctors who wanted to learn more about vaccination, and to write that book that I wrote with my co-author, Roman Bistrianic, who was pretty much the brains behind all the graphs that are in that, um, in that book there. So the doctors that are out there, based on how you were trained, they're not trained in vaccinations. They're just told what to think, what to say, when to do it. Yes. And so when we talk to them, because they're, they're just saying, yes, it's important, you should do it. I'm a doctor, I know better. But now a lot of doctors are coming out now and saying, no. So when you started the research on this book, because the, the book is chock full, you go back, is it 200 years? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've been able to get a hold of stats and graphs from countries, from organizations, health organizations. I mean, you just amassed this huge amount of data. Had that ever been done before like this? not to the extent that we did it. There are graphs that were out there that had fewer data points, but what Roman did was he got huge amounts of data points over long periods of time for both the death rates and the disease rates, and he put those into graph formation. And when you see that, it's, it's, um, it's very enlightening because what you'll see is that the death rate, say, for measles, okay. used to be very high. 100 years ago, babies were dying left, right, and center from measles. And see, that's just, that's what doctors are taught. And so, so doctors are pretty much taught one side of the story, the, the, the bright side of vaccination. They're not taught the dark side. They're not taught the, um, the, the, the actual necessity of vaccination. They don't know how to treat a case of measles. Doctors today wouldn't know how to diagnose or treat a case of measles. They wouldn't know that they need vitamin A, whereas your grandmother would have known to go right to cod liver oil. So what we showed in those graphs was that the death rate before the vaccines came along was down by over 98 percent. Say that again. Is that before the vaccine? Yes. So you have a curve. The death rate is very high and it's coming down, say, 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950. By 1963 in the United States of America, the death rate was down by over 98 percent. Now, I was taught, at least by implication, that the reason it came down was the vaccine. That's right. That's what you were taught. But you're saying that it was already down, then they created the vaccine, and it got the credit. Yes, I, and I'm saying that because that's what the vital statistics from the United Kingdom, which was actually called England and Wales in the book, and the United States, shows that. Wow. 
we we didn't make it up. It's we took the actual vital. See, even people that that disagree with us vehemently do not disagree with those graphs. But what they say in response right. is that. Well, so what? Who cares if the death rate was down? The incidence was still very high. People were still getting measles in the 1960s. And so it's, to me, it's very interesting that when you take your baby to the doctor, why does the doctor tell you you need to give vaccines? Because your baby could die. But somehow our graphs that show that the death rate was down by over 98% before the whooping cough vaccine and before the measles vaccine means nothing. If the pharmaceutical industry invented a drug that made a death rate go down by over 98%, it would become a sacrament. Yeah. Okay? But because it was done by sanitation, by clean water, by implementing child labor laws, by having doctors wash their hands before they assist a woman giving birth so that she didn't die of puerperal fever and leave her baby with no breast milk, things like that or what we really have to thank for the death rate going down. Okay, let's talk about that because I think that's what, you know, when I went through the book, I went, okay, this I did not know. So when there was a high death rate, it wasn't because the disease, you said, you're talking about measles, was so powerful, it was because the population was so weak. Am I saying that right? That's, that's, that's a good way to look at it. So think of a virus as a machine. Okay. That machine is, is it's got a program in it got a genetic program to go in and do its thing no matter what. It's, it's set on course like the space shuttle, okay? okay? And so who that machine goes into is what really makes the difference. So back in, say, the turn of the century, 1900, say, in New York City, okay. when people were living around trash heaps, we show the photos of, of the conditions that people were living under. They were basically drinking sewage as their water. Their, their sausage was made out of rotten meat and sawdust. There, there was no inspector of, of the food supply. There were very few fresh fruits and vegetables back then. So when you put a disease into a person whose immune system has been under continuous attack by the environment the way it is and by the lack of nutrition, that disease is going to be devastating. Right. So people were dying of measles. Babies were dying. Toddlers were dying. Smallpox was, was, was a problem back then. Lots of diseases that today, in the 1960s, when somebody had measles, the vast majority of people recovered uneventfully. It, they, you know, talk to a teacher that's 70, 75 years old today, and they'll tell you that they were not missing half of their class because of measles outbreaks. Whereas today, a teacher will tell you that three quarters of their class is missing. In the era of high vaccination for influenza, people are out with flu. I find that very interesting. So when you look at the data, you see a completely different picture than the story that we're told over and over again that people were dying before the vaccines. They were dying long before the vaccines, but just right before the vaccines, they weren't dying of the diseases that we now have vaccinations for, the major diseases that we write about in the book, which are measles, smallpox, um, polio, and whooping cough. Wow, man, our time is already up and we've hardly even touched this. We have another program, uh, but thank you so much. And the book is filled with not just it, it, when I read through it, it had a whole bunch of data. It's got the graphs, it's got the research from multiple places. And if anybody is interested in making a decision on this, uh, I want to encourage you to get the book. It's called Dissolving Illusions, Disease, Vaccines, and the Forgotten History. And you're going to have to make a decision on your own about this topic. Dr. Suzanne Humphrey, thank you for being with us today. Thank you.